As I've made it clear over the past few days, Nashville in 2021 was pretty trash, but 2021 on the other hand overall is one of the best years for music at large in recent memory. Right up there was 2015 and 2019. So many inventive and bold risks were taken this year in the realm of music, and nearly all of them paid off. We even got some great neo-revival albums from multiple genres in the pop and soul worlds. Olivia Rodrigo brought back the pop-punk genre in a very enjoyable way. Lil Nas X proved that he wasn't a one-hit wonder and put out a great record. Billie Eilish, Adele, and Claro proved that pop isn't totally dead, and there's still hope for the genre as a whole. Tyler, the creator, continued to put out great albums. Oh, Kanye West dropped Donda this year? Huh. I'm mostly a country guy, so a lot of the releases I'm gonna highlight are in the indie and Americana realm, but there are some other genres I will talk about as the video progresses. And in those scenes, we've got some of the best work artists have put out in years, from the musical concepts of country being pushed to the writing and down to the production. If you're looking for mainstream stars and their work, I already did a video on that if you're interested, but the talent they have is a famine compared to the big boys that came out this year. These are my 10 favorite records of 2021. Listen to these albums or die. Wait a minute, I'm not the prospector. I'm the mule. <laughs> I think of my most recent listen to the Ballad of Dude and Juanita, I liked it a little less. This does feel a little cosplay-like, and there isn't much of an emotional connection compared to the other Sturgill records. I still hate that Sam was as short as it was. If you give a mouse a cookie, he'll want a glass of milk to go with it. That's basically what this song is. But those missteps are minuscule in comparison to the soaring highs this album has. This is easily the most well-delivered record from a vocal standpoint. All all of the songs from beginning to end are distinct, not counting any of the reprises. Each bring us a new shade, highlighting different characters or plot points in this story, which is super investing. You actually want to see how this journey ends. You feel for these characters as the story goes along, and pulls no punches in highlighting the perils that occur along the way. The album itself plays off pretty elaborately for the most part. For a way to go out, it's a bit hard to picture a better way. This quintology of records tells a great and compelling journey, with this record being well up there. I don't think it totally matches the highs of its first two, there are some concessions here and there you gotta make with this record, but this is Sturgill we're talking about. The man always delivers, even if the record itself isn't that good. Juanita is one of Sturgill's best songs ever, Shamrock and Sam seem go back to his musical roots and what made his original work so phenomenal, and it's relatively creative from a genre standpoint considering it's bluegrass. Bluegrass seems to be getting back into the mainstream thanks to the likes of Billy Strings and Sturgill, so it'll be interesting to see where the genre heads after this. This bitch got me Silk Sonic, baby! Everyone and their mother is talking about how great this album and the duo is. And they are, albeit a tad bit overrated. It has its problems for sure, and it's a little annoying people hold it up as the masterpiece of 2021. The album turns out banger after banger, but eventually you begin to notice they start running out of steam pretty quickly. Fly As Me is unnecessarily douchey, and I don't think it has the same charisma as some of the other songs like Skate and Put On A Smile, and 777 as well as the final song Blast Off feel more like misfires than genuine triumphs. Plus, I think we can all agree this isn't the most lyrically sharp record, but those are literally the only problems I have with this album as I fucking love it. What a godsend of a collaborative project. Anderson Pack brings out the best of Bruno Mars whose work I haven't been that interested in a long long time. But Bruno is at the top of his game on this record. It all plays out like a concert with Bootsy Collins chiming in from time to time. It's one of the most unique records I've ever experienced, regardless of the quality represented. The whole gag and smoking out the window is probably the funniest thing I've seen all year. Skate ups the ante in terms of the album's flair and the euphoria of it all. Put on a smile gave me a message I didn't really know I needed. This is one of the most charismatic and richest experiences anyone will experience this year. There's no grand themes or mature message behind it, just great music to vibe to and just wholeheartedly enjoy without any underlying retrospection or introspection. Depending on who you are, that may be a good or bad thing. And after how much I praise this record, I think you can guess which lane I fall in. I hope this isn't a one-off thing because I just want more in the years to come. You got a friend in me. After hearing all the great music from Silk Sonic, you're probably thinking, gosh, I really like that soul revival. I wish there was someone else who can provide me with more. Well, yeah, there is, fool. Her name's Yola. Yola continues to sharpen her skills on Stand For Myself, expanding upon every single strength of her last album. Unlike the Mickey Guyton album, this one really takes you into the experiences people have with the struggles as an African American and racism at large, in a very nuanced and quite beautiful manner. The very first song explains the purpose of the album itself. In not highlighting these experiences, then nothing will ever change. Highlighting a sense of mental trapping caused by ourselves with diamond-studded shoes, where we seem to find a proper structure and it's more flawed and 
messed up than we make it out to be. Be my friend sees Yola realize all these issues she wants to tackle can't be solved on her own and needs support and none other than Brandy Carlisle teams up to relay this powerful message. These constant themes are presented in an even greater Neo Soul performance than Silk Sonic. They reach a point of solidarity with the rock anthem of Stand For Myself, knocking everything down in spectacular fashion in what is one of the most empowering and triumphant songs of all of 2021. For those wanting a blend similar to her last record with Country and Soul, this is wholeheartedly a classic soul record with minor country influences here and there. This does lack the charisma and personality Silk Sonic does, but it makes up for that with Yola's gorgeous vocal performance. One of the finest of the year, her belting and deep sustains are incredibly satisfying. Yola is building a name for herself in the world of music, and I can only hope she attains greater success. I'm just gonna come out and make this pitch. The old gods are dead. F all previous existing religion. You know, Cody Johnson's human in the grand scheme of things highlights the human experience pretty good. But I still got problems with it and it's not good enough to make this list. Emily Scott Robinson's American Siren managed to capture such a raw and true tale of the human experience in ways nearly unrivaled this year. It's not quite on the level of Traveling Mercies but still manages to be sincere and utilizes her phenomenal storytelling skills. And despite a lot of it having Christian theological roots, it portrays these individual stories that is so captivating. The kindred spirits and lost woman's prayer, the breaking down of our mental state and let them burn. It challenges our faith in higher power and faith in ourselves. She Cheap Seats is legit one of my favorite songs of all time now and I already highlighted it in my top 10 songs video and you can check it out there for more. But this album gives me so many stories and messages I need in this point of my life. I think the album falters as it draws far too much on her previous work and its strengths rather than expand. Let them burn and Cheap Seats see her delve into new waters and they are fantastic, but old gods and every day in faith feel like copy and paste at times but not to an extent like it did with the Cody Johnson album. Despite all this, American Siren is a great album with some of my favorite music ever. Boys. The comeback was one of my most anticipated albums of 2021 and it wasn't that good. It's decent and a little better than I gave it credit for, but I was beginning to think the age of the country band was fading. Flatland Cavalry, while good, didn't wow me in ways their other albums did, and I sure as hell am not getting anything of quality from Old Dominion that doesn't have cats. If only there was a group to provide me with what I desire. Oh wait! Yeah, I'm sure you've heard from a lot of people how amazing this new Mike and the Moon Pies album is. And it is. I don't think it's quite as good as others let on. Based on its placement, I don't even think it's the best album of the year. But god damn, for what it is, the album has so much. Great writing, a great performance, and dear god, the instrumentals. This album gives what is far and away the best musical performance of 2021. Mike and the Moon Pies is at the top of their game. There is so much going on, most of it different yet complementing everything so well. The high range they use for the steel is immensely satisfying on whose side you're on. The songs are all distinct and memorable in their own way. They easily set themselves apart from anything being released this year. Honestly, anything in recent memory, the rhythm, the tone, and performance are all just so unique and scream Mike and the Moon Pies. I think my biggest issue lies in the narrative now with a concept record highlighting the blue collar lifestyle and all the songs have great writing behind them and while some of the stories are interesting like Brother and the Vein, so much time and effort is spent on stories I'm not as invested in. Paycheck to paycheck while fun is kinda just blue collar fluff. Hour on the hour is just I can't listen to a song or I'll cry. I'm not trying to say the songs suck because the musical aspect is just so dang high. They're just not as interesting or live up to the heights of everything else the record has. Nor do I think the album really ties up its ending all that well wrapping up everything presented. It's a great album that's like 10 to 15% flawed with the remaining stuff being pretty close to perfect. It proves that bands and country aren't dead and there's still hope for them on the horizon. Charles Wesley Godwin made one of my five favorite albums of all time and decided another masterpiece was in order. How the Mighty Fall isn't on the level of its predecessor, but I do think they share a unique relationship. Seneca, to me, was all about capturing the past of Appalachian country, the live aesthetic of a lot of the tracks, the rooted sense of folk, and the stories contained within, all have a sense of the past and highlights it spectacularly. How the Mighty Fall, on the other hand, is all about presenting Appalachian country's future. This one experiments with the musical conventions of the genre and progresses it forward with some really interesting instrumentals and techniques. I'd say American Science and tries that but sort of faltered. This album on the other hand has them soar with flying colors. Jesse has this Appalachian and rock flare edge. Strong has an excellent guitar solo that almost feels like a fiddle solo. I respect the modern approach to the genre especially with all of the risk being quite fantastic. Unlike another album whose experimentation kind of stunk. The stories are great as per usual with Godwin. Cranes of Potter is obviously the highlight but Temporary Town is such a lush romantic song on escaping from being bound to a home you don't belong to. Jesse is all about the regret of never expressing feeling and this big 
display of affection this person does is essentially meaningless as Jesse has moved on without them. Some songs, while good, aren't the most interesting like Lying Low and Blood Feud, mostly due to the dull aesthetic of them, jiving with the grandeur of the rest of the album. And I can't believe I went this long without highlighting Godwin's voice. Best of 2021 by far, its rustic charm is irresistible. It's so warm and tender and something I believe anyone can enjoy. The highs are on par with Seneca, but there isn't enough of them to surpass its quality. Regardless, How the Mighty Fall is another success for Godwin, continuing to build a path for what could possibly be the best catalog of this generation. But Dennis! I can't be ugly, I'm a hopeless romantic. This is probably the most random pick, I've barely addressed it, and it hasn't been in much of the country discussion, casual or critical, but Bobby Dove's hopeless romantic is freaking amazing. The biggest underrated gem of the entire year. Bobby captures one of my favorite eras of country music, the grandness of classic pop meshing with classic country. Their performance is one of the most versatile. They don't have the belting vocals of Yola or the warmth of Godwin, but they display so many different tones and emotions in ways greater than both of them, which are already excellent. The traditional tone just really took me back to the glory days. More than any other album this year trying to achieve a sense of traditionalism, this one presents it with such a refreshing and modern tone. And the writing, out of any of the country albums I've listened to this year, this is one of the most exceptional. The pain of my world's getting smaller, the sadness of chance and hell, along with my personal favorite Haunted Hotel, which tells one of the most unique stories of a relationship I've ever seen. The regret of moving to your golden years while everyone else moves on happily around you. God, this album hits so hard in so many ways, proudly earning the name of Hopeless Romantic, because that's what this album is truly about. Going through the pain and sorrow yet still holding on to that perfect idea of romance panning out in the end. It explores this topic beautifully and on par with some of my other favorite romantically driven records like Red, with an end that's probably the best out of any album in 2021. If you cry during Begin Again, you're not ready for new endings and new beginnings. This may be number 4 on my list, but this is the one I want you to listen to the most because they come from someone so underappreciated and they made a masterpiece with this album. And the top 3 are projects chances are you are familiar with to some degree. Check this one out, I'm begging you. It's not just a boulder! In These Silent Days is pretty awesome. I reviewed it a month ago and this album only got better. I have far more appreciation for the writing, Brandy's vocals are great, and I absolutely love the three-way harmony between her and the Hansa Ross twins. It's incredibly soothing and just has this safety to it, washing away all the stress of my day. This is mostly accomplished on the ballads and This Time Tomorrow is the best of them when it comes to that. Broken Horses is nothing but pure fire with a powerful message of standing tall for yourself. Sinner, Saints, and Fools is one powerhouse of irony and hate speech. The songs taking on the experiences during the pandemic are excellent, but Letter to the Past, which if you haven't already seen this video, is my favorite song of 2021 and one of my favorite songs of all time. Dave Cobb and Shooter Jennings are a masterful duo in the production department. This is easily one of their best records they produced in their entire careers. The live aesthetic really comes through on this one, more so than the others bringing me into the experience itself. The album is tightly written, all the songs hit hard and memorable in their own right, with the weakest song still being great. It may not explore one narrative, but its variety of themes have strong connective tissue, making for an album that can speak for others and speak for Carlisle herself, which is something only the best albums can truly accomplish. I haven't enjoyed a country slash Americana album this much since Seneca in 2019, and it's right up there on the quality spectrum. The only problems I can find with it is the childness of Stay Gentle, which doesn't really work for me, but apart from that, this is Carlisle's best album and I can't wait to see where she goes goes next after this. I think you just scarred me for life, but thanks for being inclusive. So I listened to Sinner Get Ready by Lingua Ignota. It was one of the most frightening experiences in my life. I'm sure you've heard every other critic on the web praise this album to no end, and they're right, man. This is the most terrifying experience I've ever had with an album, and I listened to Graffiti U multiple times. Where other albums like My Savior present face in a mostly positive tone, this album does the exact opposite. It's just grand horror, spreading these harsh perspectives that can challenge even the most strong-willed of people. The voice layers are all masterful, showing this dissonance which, while tough to some, I find amazing, and really get what she is saying across so well. Everything can come off frantic and messy like nothing but unfiltered chaos. To some, they might even find the record funny, and for lesser albums, all this will probably fall apart. But that's not what Sinner Get Ready is. It's a profound tale of Christianity that shook me to my core. Perpetual Flame of Centralia, Repent Now, Confess Now offer a jarring and soul-crushing perspective. The first track, The Order of Spiritual Virgins, puts in a mother-flipping reference to an old Alan Jackson song. I wake up in cold sweat thinking about that. The incredibly disturbing sounds this industrial album has made kept me up at night for a long time. 
I warn anyone going into this blind, it's not a record designed to make you feel good. It's because of this, it's not going to be a record for everyone and more people are going to come out hating it, which is totally fine. But if you want something to move you in ways so very few albums could ever hope to accomplish, seek this one out. When I think about Inside, the name of it always struck me. I thought of it as less of Inside by Bo Burnham and more so Inside Bo Burnham. Because that's what this soundtrack really is. A character study on a man on the brink of existential collapse. This is the album that spoke to me the most on a personal level and for so many people worldwide. Showing what the pandemic has done to people from depression, anxiety, anger, and guilt. Its social commentary has aged incredibly well as we reflect on injustice, corruption, and Mark Zuckerberg becoming more of a machine. Every song is different, musically, tonally, narratively, comedically. All of it playing out like an elaborate stage play with nothing really connecting to each other. Other than the feeling of being trapped. This album can feel claustrophobic at times, and the more it piles it seems on you, the more it crushes you with the weight of what you just witnessed. This is certainly not the funniest record, but it gets the best jokes out of the way as a facade to lure you into the depressing atmosphere. It's no coincidence the record gets less and less funny as it goes along. Bo Burnham is at the top of his game. His charisma sells every gleefully dark to just utterly tragic moment. This is a record I can't picture anyone else doing. It rings true to his type of social comedy. Seeing someone else do this would not nearly work as well well as it does. Most revolve around Welcome to the Internet and All Eyes on Me, but the rest of the record shouldn't be understated. How the world works sheds our society under the cruel light it deserves. Thirty tries to tell us not to waste our lives once we get past the pandemic. That funny feeling, which while not the best, is my favorite on the whole project, which makes me ponder whether or not what it's telling us is true, if the world will make it after this. I guess it's up to ourselves to find out. The album is insanely well produced. The fact that all this music was done solely by one person is just mind blowing. No other album this year, no. No other piece of media is as powerful in terms of its social commentary as Inside. Nothing is as creative, thoughtful, forced wall breaking, and insane as Bo Burnham's Inside is. Years from now, we're still going to be talking about how much this has impacted the realm of music and film. The undisputed magnum opus of Bo Burnham. And in this random internet guy's opinion, the best album of 2021.